I'd just like to give you a huge welcome to the Children of the 90s Research Fest 2012. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Jean Golding, who is the founder of Children of the 90s, who many of you will know, um, who founded the study all those years ago, and in many ways is really the reason that we're all sat in this room um, here today. Um, we were delighted this year um, when Jean was awarded an OBE in recognition of her work, um, which she really accepted um, on behalf of Children of the 90s, uh, and really recognises all the huge contribution that you've all um, put into the study as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jean. Uh, well, first of all, can I check that uh, people can hear me? Um, of course, if you can't hear me, you won't be able to respond to this. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, is, it, is it clear? Can you hear? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, although I'm going to talk about the, uh, the history uh, of uh, the start of children of the 90s, I want to start with something bang up to date, and that is the um, uh, Paralympics. Now, those of you who saw the opening ceremony uh, will have noted that it was based on science. It had a big bang, and it had at its center uh, probably the, the biggest brain in Britain at the moment, Stephen Hawking, who has concentrated on thinking about the future uh, and um, is, is really uh, uh, fantastic in his own field. Uh, and what he said um, was um, that the most important thing was curiosity. And curiosity is actually where uh, children of the 90s came from. We started, or I started, um, with a query as to why people are so different. Um, and that's a very huge question, and, and yet one that we all ask sometimes. Um, and uh, that led on to children of the 90s. Um, but there were a number of questions we had to face before we started, such as where should we look? Um, should it be in our environment or should it be in our genes? Um, and the answer is that we should look in both places. Uh, when should we look was important. Should we look in adolescence, in childhood, in infancy, uh, when uh, the child's in the womb? Should we go back further into the parents' lives? Should we go back further into the grandparents' lives? Uh, and the answer to all of those was yes. And of course, now we'll be talking about going into the future as well. Uh, the question of how should we do it uh, was you can't do it without having the information. And that's where you all came in. And as you know, we collected information in all sorts of different ways. So we had self-completion questionnaires. Uh, we had health records, biological samples. We monitored the environment in various places. We got the education records and, of course, hands-on assessments. And just to remind you of some of that, the self-completion questionnaires started early in pregnancy. And um, the unsuspecting mothers who were here um, will have completed this without realizing that this was the start of a huge horde of questionnaires that would flood onto their, uh, in their post. Uh, we also uh, tried to enroll the partners, but we asked the mothers to do it. So we weren't quite sure of the response rate, whether the partners were really keen to fill in questionnaires or whether the mothers actually didn't give it to them because they thought they were so busy or wouldn't be interested. But we still got very unique data from the partners uh, and have continued uh, once the child was born getting information on the child 
And then those of you who are children will remember you started getting questionnaires when you were about five and have continued ever since. And that was formed a huge set of data that's been incredibly valuable. We haven't um, plundered all of it yet. There's an enormous amount that we're going to look at. Uh, and perhaps the most uh, important in many ways and uh, key um, sets of data were uh, actually examining, uh, first of all, the children and later the parents. And if you remember um, the, the uh, uh, body scans, uh, which we started when the children were nine, this I was very proud of because we were the first study ever to use the DEXA scan and we grabbed the first one in the country. So what has been found? Well, how long have you got? Um, a week would barely do it. So I'm just going to highlight one or two things that I've been involved with which I thought were fascinating. Um, one of those is looking at the diet in pregnancy and how that might affect uh, the child as it grows up. Um, somewhere here, perhaps he hasn't arrived yet, is Dr. Hiblin, who's from America, who um, is particularly interested in this, and we've done uh, studies with him looking at the effect of fish on the brain. Now, fish has all sorts of things in it that are good for the brain, including omega-3 fatty acids, but also iodine and various vitamins. And what we found was um, that if we looked at the IQ of the children, now let me explain this one to you. We're starting by looking at the number of portions of fish that the mother eats in a week. So the women who eat three or more portions in pregnancy artificially will say they had um, uh, the normal risk. Then if they le ate less than that, they had 43% higher risk of their child having a low IQ. And if they ate no seafood at all, it was over twice as much. That is what the study is all about. <laughs> um, just to go back, that turns out to be very important, particularly in the United States where they are so scared of mercury, which is a contaminant of a lot of fish, um, that they recommend that nobody should eat as many as three portions of fish a week. So in fact, they're getting the wrong message. The, the positive effects of fish are much greater than any negative effects. And we looked at very common things in uh, the environment. So this is what was happening in people's homes. We were measuring how often all these different chemicals were being used or sprayed or whatever uh, by the mother in pregnancy. And then we looked at um, a, a sort of score that we gave, which we called a total chemical burden. Uh, which turns out to have this wonderful normal distribution. Um, and if we compare the homes that have very low levels of chemicals in them with those who have very high chemicals, um, we get this um, risk 2.3 times the normal risk is what you get if you're in a high chemical burden household. Uh, and that uh, is a risk of p persistent wheeze and turns into asthma. So basically this is the risk for asthma if you've got a home where you're spraying and uh, doing all sorts of things with different chemicals all the time. 
chemicals have changed over time. So it, um, I'm hoping that we can look at the new group of chemicals in the future. Uh, this is a rather amusing one. We, uh, a lot of people don't realize that women do have testosterone in their blood. Um, and if a mother has um, a, a female girl in the uterus, uh, it does depend on how much testosterone she has in the blood as to the sort of play that that child will turn out to want to spend her time with. So feminine girls tend to be the ones who like playing with dolls, dress up as princesses, um, well, we're talking about age three and a half here. We're not talking <laughs> further than that. You'll be delighted to know. But you can see that if you, your mother has got low testosterone, then uh, the girls uh, will be much more feminine um, than if they've got higher testosterone. That's not the only thing that influences um, how you play and whether you want to play with dolls, but it's one of the things. One of the major things we found out uh, to do with pregnancy uh, was uh, by measuring the anxiety of the mother in pregnancy, we were able to link that to all sorts of outcomes. Uh, and this shows that if the mother, towards the end of pregnancy, has a major amount of anxiety, then she's twice as likely to have a child who is hyperactive. Um, and that has now been repeated in other studies. And following our children up, we can tell it's had a long-term effect on the children uh, because it's the way in which the child now reacts to anxiety uh, or stressful situations that uh, is probably affected. So wherever we look, we're showing long-term effects. And I've only just talked about pregnancy. Um, one of the um, major uh, effects we showed early on uh, wasn't to do with pregnancy, it was to do with infancy, um, we looked at peanut allergy. Now, peanut allergy is a, a, a curious disorder. Most allergies occur um, after you've been exposed more than once. Um, so if you have a bee sting, it's the second bee sting that you might have an allergic reaction to. People were puzzled because the first time uh, people are uh, associated with peanuts or peanut butter, um, and if they're going to be peanut allergic, they react straight away. So this was very curious indeed. Uh, and what we were able to show was actually they had been exposed earlier. Um, the children who were affected with peanut allergy tended to have had eczema and other nasty rashes very early on, and the creams that were put on them had peanut oil in them. So you were putting peanut oil actually on skin that was already broken with nasty rashes, and that had um, uh, triggered uh, the bloodstream so that there would be a reaction when they came across peanuts. And that has had an effect whereby most manufacturers have now taken peanut oil out of their preparations. These were common preparations, didn't have to be prescribed. Um, but now at least there are warnings on the preparations. And that's absolutely thanks to children of the 90s. So as I neared the end of my um, uh, time as the director of ALSPAC, we had a great party. Um, it was time to hand over, um, and um, George Davy Smith, who I'd hoped was now going to cycle on, but can't be here yet, um, took over the directorship of uh, the study. Uh, so I want to end, I can't end with the closing ceremony of the Paralympics, 
but this was the end of the opening ceremony. And I think that, that perhaps is more appropriate because it's the opening, even though you've been going 21 years, this is just the beginning. Uh, there's a long way to go. Uh, certainly the researchers are working incredibly hard all over the world looking at the information you've given us. Thank you.